I, I <laughs> sort of discovered Ferrante last year. I was in India, partly working, partly with my son who lives in Asia, and I picked up uh, my brilliant friend at a bookstore in Delhi. And I, I took it with me as I traveled, and I couldn't bear to be parted from it. Um, and in fact, separation anxiety is one of her great themes. Uh, the, attach the visceral attachment to the body, often of the mother, but, um, or a surrogate person. So I, I started with my own separation anxiety about Ferrante. And when I got back to Delhi, you have to go back and forth, I got the next volume. And I gave the first volume to a friend, which I then regretted because I was desperate to have the complete set. So her publisher eventually sent me another copy of the first volume. And on it went. I didn't get to the early novels, of which this is the first, uh, till after I had read all of the, the four volumes in the tetralogy. Um, and, and then I, it sort of was interesting as a critic to do it in reverse, rather than starting at the beginning and working your way through. And I read this in Italian. I, I was invited last, um, last summer, sort of 4th of July weekend, to a literary festival called the Conversazioni, uh, which takes place every year on Capri. And um, it was very pleasant, and I had a, a very interesting talk with Edna O'Brien. And then I had three days in Naples on my own, and I was alone there. It was 100 degrees, and the city was the kind of seething, boiling, invasive, overwhelming Naples that she writes about. So I went on a Ferrante pilgrimage, and I, I went from place to place that she had mentioned in the novels. Uh, and I walked, this, the, 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 the mad peregrinations in this book sort of was, without anybody following me or looking for anybody, um, was sort of what I did in Naples. And one night I walked for four hours the entire, the entire distance across the city and down that stretch of the, uh, of the sort of corniche along the waterfront that she describes with the storm crashing and the waves breaking and the grand hotels all lined up in a row. And then beyond that, and then to the tunnel where the tunnel begins, where, where the old, the, the neighborhood, the sort of the uh, outline, the banlieue, it's not a suburb, it's really a, a banlieue, where that begins. And on the way back, of course, I'm curious, as is everybody, about Ferrante. Um, uh, I have my own theories about who she might be. I have no doubt that she's a woman. We can talk about this. Um, but um, on the way back, near my hotel, which was in the center of the city, uh, I was descending a st steep and narrow street. And I looked, and in a filthy doorway, a sordid, filthy doorway, like the filthy, sordid doorways that she describes here, lying in the filth, there was a naked doll, a naked abandoned doll. And the doll is a figure in several of her novels, the doll who is lost or thrown away or stolen. And there was this doll. And I thought, you want to take a picture of it, but I don't take pictures. I still have a Blackberry, and I just never take pictures. And then I regretted it. And I thought, this was a sign. This was, this was this was a wink from the ghost of Ferranti. So I went back. I couldn't find it. It was very sad. And then the next day, coming back from one of my walks, there in the doorway, the doll was back. So that, that, that image of, the, of Naples, the doorway, the abandoned doll, the, the street, the criers. Um, I'm too old anymore in Naples for, for guys to bother me, which is sort of relaxing. It's sort of depressing. But um, that was my, my Ferrante's Naples. Um, I, while I was there, in the bookshops near the university on the Port Alba, is a whole street of bookshops, and I found L'Amore Molesto, as it's called in Italian, in Italian, and I started to read it. And my Italian is good, but her Italian is very literary, and it's also very earthy. It's cathonic. And that combination was daunting for me, so I read it with a certain kind of desperation that makes it possible for you to understand things you normally wouldn't if you were less attentive. And I managed to get through it. 
but I sat down to read it in English for the first time in preparation for tonight. Um, and I had a, I had a, uh, so the veil was gone. I could, I could really read the, uh, I could really read the prose in a, in a much more connected way. And, um, and I was sort of staggered at how, I, I had been concentrating so hard on understanding it that I was free to take things in the way you do in a foreign place when all of your senses are attuned, but you, you're, you're, you're able to concentrate on what you're taking in. So I was very happy to have that chance to do this for, for the class and to, um, uh, and to get back in touch with it. Now, one thing I want to point out, you're, you're students of comparative literature, so many of you know this. The title in Italian is L'amore molesto. And, and Anne Goldstein, the, the translator who's my colleague at The New Yorker and a friend, she's an incredible translator. And people even say she translates everything up. In other words, she gives the, the text that she translates a purity or a clarity or an elegance. Or you know, she tidies them as she, as she gets to their pith, which I think is true in some cases. Um, but the um, L'amore molesto is impossible to translate. And it, it's the absolute perfect title for the book. And molestare in Italian can mean something relatively uh, benign. It just means bother. It can mean bother. It can mean trouble. But it also has the sense that it has here the double sense of, of, of molestation. Um, because this is a book about violation. Um, it's a book about claustrophobia. It's a book about the desperate search for integrity, physical integrity and emotional integrity, uh, and the sort of hallucinatory challenges to being whole and to being separate. And I was thinking about how I learned to read and, and then how I learned to read and how I learned to read critically, which is what I do most of the time, and how that related to this book. And, um, and it related also to my experience in Naples, where I had been once in 1967. So I, it was as if I had never been to Naples. And when you're, especially when you're young, but not necessarily only, when you're in a new place, your senses recover their original design, if you believe in design, or their original function, which is to gather intelligence. And the gathering of intelligence is also the gathering of pleasure. So at a certain level, a certain very, very sort of prim primitive level, the gathering of the intelligence that's necessary for survival and the pleasure that you get from the senses and sounds and, 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 and sensory experience of the environment in which you're gathering that together create a very powerful impression. And if you're a professional reader, the way I am, you sometimes forget that. You think, oh, well, I better read this. Oh, it's not. And if you can relax into reading the way you relax into a sort of Walter Benjamin-like, Flaner-like uh, exploration of a place. Uh, I, 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 I was reminded of that rereading this book. Um, you're attuned to what's going on under the surface. You're paying attention in a way that you don't when you're just cerebrally engaged. So um, you can't always do that. Um, Andre and I were talking about you can't do that with every writer. Some writers are very cerebrally demanding. You can, it's hard to read Kierkegaard that way. Um, but, but Ferrante invites that, just as her Naples invites that. And then there's something else that I, I, I'm working on a profile of a Chinese couturier, which is really a story about the new China, the new rich, uh, the disparities of wealth, the, 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 the desperate search for an identity uh, of young Chinese, because, you know, modernity is, modern is really a synonym for westernized, and that they're trying to sort of get it. And I was writing about Alexander McQueen and his 
this couturier does extraordinary dreamlike clothes. Um, and I was thinking about McQueen and the way he works. And they both, to some degree, and, and Ferrante, it's silly to compare it to a dressmaker, but nevertheless, they work the way a dreaming mind works. And a dreaming mind, I think, I think there's a program that it runs when we fall asleep, but I'm not going to get into the neurology of it. My degrees in neurology come from Trump University. Um, it needs to draw out and release the toxins of suppressed instinct. We rest for that purpose. They're not only to refresh the systems, but we're imbued with toxins, emotional toxins, traumas, um, uh, and you have to sort of get rid of them. You have to cleanse your. You have to cleanse your mind so it's free to receive new impressions, so it's free to function. And dreams discharge the toxins of suppressed instinct in images, in uh, in 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 visceral, frightening sometimes, moving sometimes puzzling most of the time imagery. Um, in a dream, as we know, time is collapsed. It's time, you can be three in a dream and at the same time you can be 60 in a dream. Somebody can, who's been dead for 40 years will appear and it will feel completely natural. Um, the past and the present, rationality and irrationality, they're all collapsed. When I read this book, I realized to what degree this book is a reflection, is a sort of mirror of that dreaming mind. And to what degree as well, she reproduces the terrible claustrophobia of a bad dream, but also the marvel of it. Aren't you awake sometimes in your bad dreams and thinking, my mind is producing this? Is, is this possible? Where, where does this come from? How do these pieces, pieces come together? And the, and and, and the, the tension builds up. The tension builds up all throughout the text. A terrible, unbearable anxiety. I'm, I'm going to read you some quotes. An unbearable anxiety. Sexual tension that she can't release. She can't have an orgasm when she's having sex in the horrible hotel. Uh, she, there, there's the, the, the tension, the menstrual tension that's brought on by her mother's funeral. All of these things are striving, straining, trying to explode. Um, and it reproduces the way that the dreaming mind seeks to create catharsis, often through tragic scenarios that don't make sense, and whose puzzles have a... Uh, the, the pieces of the puzzle, you know, the analysis tries to put the pieces of the puzzle to get, together in a poetic way to discern their hidden meaning um, and the, the hidden charge of emotion that they're trying to release. And she does too. So this, this book, I felt I don't know anything about her, except that I'm positive she's a woman. Um, I'm sure she's a woman of about 70, because when you read the, uh, the, the tetralogy, she's lived through certain things, and she's lived through certain things in such a passionate way that it's hard to believe she didn't really live through them, that she's some 30-year-old in, in um, Milan somewhere. Uh, but this had the feeling to me of a book that she not only had to write, she couldn't not write this book if in some way she was going to survive both as a writer and as a human being. So it's terrifying. It's a terrifying book. And it's also so personal. It's so... Um, she deals with revulsion and disgust in such a free way uh, that you can understand having dreamt this, having written it, and having exposed it, that she would not be so willing to uh, expose herself and, the, dream, and the, the mind of the dreamer to all of the, you know, publicity and curiosity and prying and, and uh, gossip and all the rest of it that um, famous writers have to deal with. Um, 
So I don't think she should tell anybody who she is. I would have loved, I wanted desperately to do a profile of her. And the New Yorker basically said, well, if she won't sit down with you, then we can't do it. And I thought, no, it's not, that's not the important thing. She will engage you in an email exchange, with an email exchange, which to me seems as intimate a way. And what more anonymous communications do you have than with a stranger on a train? You're never going to see them again. You don't know who they are. You don't have to exchange names. I thought that would be possible with her. But I think she's, I think after this book, you understand why Ferrante, whoever she is, doesn't want to um, give up her anonymity. I'm reading her letters now. And, uh, apparently, when, when she writes about how hard it is for her to write and how she struggles for the truth with every phrase, she doesn't write like that. She's not a sort of explosive like Joyce Carol Oates or people who just go into a trance and but it was very, very, this was a deliberate book and she struggled with every sentence. So it wasn't written the way it sounds. It, it wasn't, she had to construct that emotional intensity one sentence at a time, you know, going to sleep and getting up again and going about her business. It's really constructed. It's, it's, and the, the coherence of the imagery, when you start to right. dissect it, um, now part of that is dreamlike. You can, you, sometimes it happens to me, I find, I, want, I wind up after a long, long, long thing with a kind of story-like coherence that I didn't intend, that, I, I'm, that surprises me. That, that sort of strange, uh, incoherent coherence. And sometimes you'll write something and, and you'll reread it, maybe even years later, and you'll see this sort of strange inner coherence that is dreamlike, that you didn't, uh, you didn't plant. You didn't plant it. It's there, mysteriously. But she's a very deliberative writer. A book like this to come out, this is published in, let's say she's 70, just because it's an easy number to do the math for. She was a very mature writer by the time she wrote this first novel. And that's interesting to think about because, yeah, uh, because um, you also wonder what she wrote and didn't publish, if anything. You also, you also wonder what she had been writing. And um, you also wonder if the death of a mother, uh, that would have been a plausible age for the mother of a woman now 70 to have died. And, um, around that. and so you wonder what personal upheavals unleashed this, even if it's not unleashing in the sense of the, the actual method of not an unleashed writing, but it's certainly unleashed emotion. Um, this is a book. This is a book also about fateful undertoes. Uh, and they're literal undertoes. There's the sea that is pulling, her, <clears throat> sea that is pulling her mother out. We don't know if the mother actually committed suicide. At one point, at the end, she thinks she just went for a swim and went too far. There's this undertow, the sea, of the undertow of the sea. There's the undertow of the crowds. There's undertow of these crowds in Naples that shove her onto the subway and then they prevent her from getting off and they push her along streets and she's pulled along by Poledro and she's there's this this the, the the tidal flow of menstruation, the tidal flow of that governs a woman's body, that tidal flow and the tidal flow of her feelings that she struggles to contain and she cannot. You know, people who write books from the point of view of children have a hard time. How do you get into, how really does a sophisticated writer wanting to do a sophisticated work of literature to speak from the point of view of a child? Some great writers are doing this. This is harder. She is writing from the point of view of a two-year-old, a pre-verbal child, who is going through the throes of, I don't even want to call it the edible complex because that makes it to, you know, mother and son of that complex where you want to destroy, eat, gnaw, suck, tear, annihilate your parent so that they can resist your aggression and be there for you. You want to possess, you want to take that mother away from whatever partner, 
the father probably, maybe not now anymore so much, but the father, because you want, whether you're a girl or a boy, she has to be all yours or you are alone and dizzying and falling and in free fall without that possession. You desperately need, at the same time, to be not the mother. Otherwise, you are also annihilated. One of the reasons you reject her and push her away and is you, you are not her. There has, to be, uh, there has to be a you and an I. And the, one of the first truly... One, children are insane until a certain point. I mean, not clinically insane, but they live in a world of sort of... of, 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 of um, where rational concepts and uh, don't yet reassure them. And one of the first rational concepts that a child who is raised with a good enough mother gets is the other. And the self and the other. That is one of the moments. When that happens, when that happens, you are on your way to personhood. And there are many parents who, for whatever reason, inhibit that or, or screw it up or interfere with it, and then you are not on your way to personhood. You are probably on your way to a lot of trouble in your future object relations yourself. And what I find extraordinary about Ferrante in this book is she is writing about that. She's writing, her character is 45 years old, but her character is two. Any time her mother is not focused on her as a child, she is sure that her mother is taking pleasure from which she is excluded, that another body, her mother is in contact with another body that is not her body, um, that her mother is being happy with another person who is not her. And she locks herself up. She recreates the claustrophobia. I, I don't know. I don't want to be too Freudian about this. But she does recreate the claustrophobia of the womb in that little storeroom where she locks herself up to wait for her mother as if she needs the dark space of a womb to reassure her of this broken connection. And, you know, it, never having outgrown this in a way, um, she comes back to it when she goes back to Naples to find out, in fact, how her mother died. Um, the violence the accepted violence in this book, which runs throughout all of her books, is, is something that by not flagging it as unexceptional, she is giving you an even more terrifying sense of mm -hmm. its power. But, um, but some of the, the, the so this, this Oedipal drama, let's forget that Oedipus was a prince and his mother, uh, this drama that all two-year-olds have, two and three, one and a half and two, um, is extraordinarily embodied, truly embodied, embodied in this purse. Um, she says, she transformed my body into that of a wizened child. With her, I could only be self-contained and insincere. Now, that's when, that's when her separation has become too extreme because she can't negotiate separate and together. She, this is a woman with extreme problems with intimacy um, that come, that, that, that's part of the drama that's being described here. Um, then she says one of the most sorry lines, tragic lines, no human being would ever detach itself from me with the anguish with which I had detached myself from her only because I had never been able to attach myself to her definitively. I mean, I don't think all of psychoanalytic literature contains an expression as concise and powerful as that of this, the separation anxiety of attachment disorder. Uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's really masterful. Tetralogy, my brilliant friend in the, in the three other books, is the story of... Um, a, a different but Delia-like woman who manages against every odds to get an education 
that enables her to move into a world of cultivated people for whom this barbaric tribe, it's like the Eloi and the, what is the, the, um, in, or in H.D. Wells' um, the, the, this like some sort of tribe of troglodytes is, is, is how she describes sort of these Neapolitans. And there's a wonderful description here, and I, it, it's so clear about the two worlds. Uh, the world that she has temporarily left, moving to Rome and getting an apartment and getting a normal job and cutting her hair short and being sort of, she sounds sort of like a very uh, kind of boyish uh, figure. So she's in the hotel, and um, she's waiting for Poledro, and she looks through the window at the banquet. She says, there were at least 200 people. An evident disparity among the diners struck me. Some were restrained, intent, ill at ease, at times ironic, at times accommodating, in general, soberly refined. Others were flushed moving restlessly between food and talk, their bodies laden with everything that might signify the possibility of expense of streams of money. It was particularly the women who synthesized the differences between their men. Slender bodies wrapped in clothing of a fine make, nourished with great frugality and discreetly illuminated by courteous smiles, sat beside bodies bursting out of tight dresses as costly as they were allowed, sparkling with gold and jewels, peevishly silent or chattering and laughing, the very picture of a kind of incontinence um, versus the restraint that she defines, that defines itself as refinement. And these two sort of atmospheric levels, one suffocating where you can't breathe and the other sort of the refined, clean, alpine air of uh, privilege um, is one of Ferrante's great subjects. Uh, and she refuses as a writer to use dialect, I think, on purpose. She's not going back there that way. It's, it concerns the distance that she tries to take from this wor world whose, whose violence is is expressed in dialect, and almost every reference to dialect is, goes with obscenity. The most obscene, the most brutal, the most this dialect. The sound of obscenities uttered in dialect, the only obscenities that could fit together sound and sense in my head in such a way as to make concrete a sex that was troublesome in its aggressive, pleasure-seeking, and sticky realism. Every other formula outside of that dialect seem to me insignificant, often lighthearted, pronounceable without repulsion, softened in an unexpected way, becoming a kind of rustling against the roller of an old typewriter. Typewriter's another machine. That's one sentence. It's the only sentence in the book like that. And, and I think she's giving you, again, it's a sentence that expresses this undertow, this sort of terrible tsunami-like undertow that she's constantly fighting, the undertow of the dialect, the undertow of the violence, the undertow of the menace, um, and I, th that's on purpose. That was not just, she forgot where to put the, 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 um, um, the period. The mention of the typewriter, uh, I think, as one of the machines, the sewing machine and the typewriter, um, I don't think the coffee machine is in this category, they're the mother's, the mother's work, her attention to the female body, she, the way she makes the clothes and cuts the patterns, the, the flat paper of the pattern and the flat paper of the page that have to summon up real life are very connected for Ferrante and connected to her mother. Um, and her mother, of course, is not an artist, although her father is. And so there's a sort of strange triangulation between Ferrante, the writer, the mother who does these designs out of, evokes the body, embodies characters in her cloth, and the father who tries and fails to embody the real woman, to summon a real flesh and blood woman on the canvases that he obsessively paints. 
And that's also a sort of Oedipal triangle in this book. Ferrante, she's denuding, or no, she's, she's stripping them. She's laying them bare in their most private places. I mean, I don't know of another important novelist who writes about menstruation. Can I, I can't think of a novel in which menstruation plays this kind of role. People may get their periods. Can anybody think of one? I, I don't know. It's, it's the, it is a nightmare of, of terrible anxiety, that exposure, the incontinence. Um, horrible things coming out you still have nightmares about it. This, this is a book that takes back a lot of power in a very risky way, that claims a lot of power. And she is, it's very transgressive. All of this stuff about the menstruation and the vomiting and touching herself. And, and, and I think what's really transgressive, I want to throw this out, as a, is the incestuous sexuality of little kids. I actually don't, can't think um, of another book that is so frank about it. And it's something that is really taboo. I mean, people have written Almodovar as a guy. Men have written about their sexual passions for their mother. It's somehow not as appalling. But, of course, it's the same. Little kids don't really, they don't know whether they're girl or boy initially. I think it's erotic. I think it's that it's that polymorphous, perverse sexuality of little kids. It's sexual. I mean, um, you know, if you've had a child and you've nursed a child, it's it's not sexual. But it's definitely it's it's a it's an erotic. Uh, it's an act of incorporation. It's an act of penetration. Incorporation. It is very erotic. She writes about it with more um, boldness, with more. Uh, uh, freedom. And again, that's another reason that I have to wonder if she feels she might lose some of that freedom to the tidiness of these nice, ironic, refined people with their, um, their lovely clothes. And, uh, and uh, irony itself is a form of containment. As he pointed out, there's not much humor in this book. There's, it's, too, it's too primal to be ironic. And irony itself may be one of those literary cultivated devices that she's deprived herself of for that reason. So the play between incredible primitiveness and, and refinement is, goes on in all of her books. Uh, can she escape it? Is she a fraud? This doesn't come so much to play here, but in the later books, the sense of fraudulence. And when she breaks into, she's very careful to speak proper Italian. This is, another, this is another big issue in this book. She speaks proper Italian as a way of asserting her otherness and the undertow of the dialect pulling her back in. Proper Italian otherness. And then sometimes she reverts to dialect, and it's always very conscious. She buys a sandwich in dialect. She talks to the old guy who's guarding the children in dialect. She sees herself as another person when she speaks dialect. The mother comes to visit her, and, um, and so she, the mother tries to speak proper Italian, and then the mother reverts to dialect. So these reversions, regret, the reg regression, what is more of an undertow than regression? So I think that um, that has a lot to do with it. I just wanted to go back to the, to, as we were saying, to um, the act of writing and the act of of dressmaking and, and the act of painting, all of which take place on a flat surface. To measurements of bust and hips. Those measurements taken by discreetly embracing, with her seamstress's tape, embracing female bodies of all ages, became paper patterns that, fastened to the fabric with pins, portrayed on it the shadows of breasts and hips. Now intently as she cut the material, stretched tight, following the outline imposed by the pattern. For all the days of her life, she had reduced the uneasiness of bodies to paper and fabric. And perhaps it had become a habit. And so out of habit, she tacitly rethought what was out of proportion, giving it the proper measure. I had never thought about this. And now that I had had, I couldn't ask her if it really had been like that. Everything was lost. Um, so that's, 
the analogy to fiction of taking the world and reducing it to paper and, and, and making it better, sort of improving it. Um, of course, what Ferranti does is she doesn't reduce the uneasiness of bodies. She enhances the uneasiness of bodies. She magnifies. She gives volume to the uneasiness of bodies. So there's a real play between volume and flatness, including the flatness of emotions. There's this, this sort of... Um, the flatness of Delia's emotions and the violence of them at the same time. So the volume and flatness, volume and flatness is, is sort of just a sort of a constant, it's part of this sort of constant struggle. Everything is about the impossi impossibility of release and about the impossibility of holding in the unsayable and the monstrous. And she says uh, this, this line, which is so central. I was to such an extent determined to become different from her that one by one I lost the reasons for resembling her. And this makes the ending for me very, very mysterious. She has isolated herself. She's sort of, she's walled herself off the way she walled herself off as a child in, in this, to contain things that are uncontainable and that finally can't be contained. And they flood, they begin flooding out, beginning with the blood, and then everything else floods out of her. All of these fantasies and memories that she has suppressed, culminating in the, 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 the most awful of the memories of being molested. Um, she's been trying to keep this, she has this tight, she describes it with this tight, muscular body, very flat, uh, this short hair, living alone not married, doesn't want children, nobody will ever detach themselves from her. Um, so she is, she has a sort of desperate need for detachment. She can't, she also, the primary bond of trust that you would normally have with your mother, she didn't have because she was so jealous of her mother and she suspected her mother of betraying her. So with, with anybody who wasn't herself, mm -hmm. that she doesn't have it with anybody. Um, and yet she doesn't blame her mother. This is not a, a, a book. She, does, she sort of takes it all on herself. She doesn't blame her mother for being her, her, who she was. Mm -hmm. And the burden devolves upon Delia. Caserta has defaced the mother's ID card to look like her. And then she takes her ID card and she defaces it to look like the mother. Is this surrender? Or is it conquest? I, I don't know. I think, I think one of the, the, the mysteries... At first I thought... She cops out in the end. It's too easy. She's because she merges with the mother. But I'm not sure that's what happened. She, the mother drowned on her birthday. Right. Mm -hmm. Spacavento. Chase the wind. The mother drowns on her birthday. So the mother chose to drown herself on Dilly's birthday. There's that too. What does it mean if you choose to kill yourself on your daughter's birthday? Um, uh, th this incredible inner violence. This is a woman of violent feelings and emotions, and she formulates it in violent ways. And she's the, the, the men, are, uh, the father hits her, and, the, and Poledro just sort of throws her on the bed, and, and she doesn't struggle. Mm -hmm. This woman who's desperately struggling so hard in her relationship with her mother gives up in her relationship to men. Uh, and that was, except that she, and she clearly lives alone and has given up on, on, on sex, um, or not given up, she's decided to be celibate. Uh, so she thinks of herself as old, she's 45, she said, you, you know, you're too old for these clothes. Uh, that's about a, a, a deep, theme that's not so primal, that's, that's cultural in this book, also primal. The, a woman's struggle for physical integrity in the world of this Naples, in this working class, poor, patriarchal, violent Naples, that as a young woman particularly, but not only, and I lived in Rome, and it was the same then when I was young, you were, pe people were, your physical integrity, your space, was constantly being violated. Uh, it was as if and people would grab at you. They would just grab you. And um, 
and they would follow you with these horrible catcalls. And, and so it was a constant struggle for integ integrity. Like your membrane was porous and anybody could, could sort of come through and suck something out of you. It was a very, you, in, in those days in Latin countries, that was the rule rather than the exception. Um, if you were young, especially, I didn't particularly look foreign, but it didn't matter. It was, it, the cult, people accepted, they, they felt men, it, it was a point of virility in this world, not all over Italy, not in every class, certainly, but in this world, uh, you had the sort of the right to do this. And people would, you know, would cluck, but they wouldn't think that, the, they wouldn't sort of think that the guy was out of bounds. The children who grew up with the violence in their, they hated, the, the girls hated him. And they encouraged their mother to get away. But nobody ever thought of calling the police or getting a restraining order. Mm -hmm. That simply was unthinkable. Uh, it was routine. The way, the way violence still is against women, uh, you know, honor killings and this and that, routine. And honor killings were also pretty much accepted. So some of the sentences that struck me. She's drowning in undigested emotions. Uh, I, could, I couldn't, nor did I want to search outside myself. This is the expression of this terrible claustrophobia. I had Amalia under my skin like a hot liquid that had been injected into me at some unknown time. Um, Amalia's body couldn't be contained. I couldn't hold back retching, and for a few seconds I was afraid my whole body would be unleashed against me with a self-destructive fury that as a child I had always feared. That fury seems to me is her own aggressive impulse towards her mother that she's so afraid of, uh, or part of it. Or you don't, have to, you don't even have to make columns because there's a sort of swirling organic oneness to these, to these claustrophobic feelings in which she and her mother are one, and she's desperately trying in the course of the whole book to separate it, and she's losing, she's losing the separation battle. And then to come back to the violence, there's the tidal flow of violence in this world. Uh, the violence that is, is um, that can explode like a storm at any moment. Uh, she's just relieved that the Pelledra wants to rape her, that he doesn't want to beat her up. You know, this is like, oh, okay, I can deal with that. Um, and the, you know, the, fa the rage of the father who, the brutality. And if you read mm -hmm. the other books, this hallmark of her is the way she treats the, the, um, the domestic violence that was not called domestic violence. It was just, well, Wife beating, you know, wife, it was called wife beating, which doesn't really, is a very anodyne word in a way. Wife beating. Well, people wear wife beaters, right? T-shirts. But she gives you a sense of it. She gives you a sense. It's more evil. It seems more vicious because it's so ordinary. It's not spotlit. She gives in. This is the world also that she comes from. This is a culture. Uh, in which wife beating is normal. People don't think about it. They don't complain about it. Everybody witnesses it. He beat her on, the father beat the mother on buses. He beat her in the street. He was kicking her practically to death. Did anybody say anything or call the police? No, they wouldn't have called the police in Naples in, the, in that time. The women of this culture internalized the patriarchal uh, values of the culture and the sense that it was a, it was a terrible old saying, uh, I beat my wife every day, why? Uh, if I don't know the reason, she does. That was, you heard that. It, it, it's, it's something that was said of many cultures, not just Italian cultures. It was, it was, it was an Egyptian saying, and it was this saying. It, many cultures, patriarchal cultures, have had a version of that statement. I beat her because if I don't know what she did, she does. And so Delia has has the, 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 she's not guilty of anything, this woman, and yet she has internalized the sense of her, um, her wrongness, yeah. Independent of her will and of what she really did, 
and yet readily appearing as needed in every gesture, in every breath. I underline that too. And I put three question marks though, because I, I, I was I puzzled over. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not saying it's it's not definitive. It, it's just the way our relationships with our mothers, even after they're dead, are not definitive. They're, they inhabit our dreams. We think about them. We refer to them. We can, we can embrace them. We can reject them. But we take them with us um, everywhere. and Well, most places. And um, we do. And I, I, I don't think the end is definitive. It's sort of unsatisfying in some ways. But you're left, that unsatisfied feeling is, I think, also the, the, she refuses to give the reader a catharsis. And, um, and I, I, I sat there sort of stunned when I read it in Italian and in my hundred, in my, the whole hotel room was 100 degrees, but Naples was. And, um, and, and, I, and I sort of said, no, don't leave me here, don't leave me here. Uh, and it was the wail of Delia saying when her mother left, oh, don't leave me here. Whatever we think about what has happened to her, she is at peace when she puts on that suit and goes to that beach and takes off her shoes and feels the sand and sits on the solid stump. Um, mm -hmm. she, she has, she's possessed her own story. The mother's now dead, so she can't hurt her anymore. She can't be hurt anymore. Um, and she has, to, she has to go back to the place underground, the womb, the, 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 fetid, the fetid womb, and go back in there and then come out again. And, um, and she comes out and she emerges from the womb as her mother. Has she repossessed her? It's, it, it's, it's, it's uh, as in a dream, you don't know. You can puzzle, you can talk about it, we can talk about it, we can have different interpretations of it. But there's probably no definitive, each dreamer will interpret the dream differently. And, uh, um, but that's, that's also why this is so, such an insanely personal book. And I think, ironically, the fact that she's anonymous makes it more personal. The anonymity adds to the intensity, totally enhances the intensity of the sense of, you cannot know who I am because I have, I have exposed myself. This was great. I was really, really enjoyed. You're so welcome.